Welcome to Pixels Rising, Radio Adelaide's on-air video game program, where we take a close look at the local Australian and LA video game industries, as well as promote local gaming communities and events. I'm Molly, and I'm joined by my host, co-host, Shell. Hi, hi. And today we're joined by Christopher Larkin, an award-winning composer and sound designer for video games, TV, and film. Over the past few years in the games industry, he has created the soundtrack for Adelaide's own Expand and worked on the sound design for Pac-Man 256 from Hipsterwell in Melbourne. More recently, he's been working with Team Cherry on their debut title, Hollow Knight, which is coming out on the 24th of February, and recently released the full soundtrack for the game on Bandcamp on the 10th. Thank you for joining us on the show, Chris. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah. Um, just to, as a bit of an intro, for anyone that doesn't know really what a composer or sound designer does, what, what do those roles compose of? Like, what is your day, day-to-day like? Yeah, sure. So... Um the role of a composer really is determined by um, how the composer is being, I guess, commissioned. Say, like, uh, in the classical period, a composer might be writing music for, like, a royal court or something like that. Or if maybe a DJ is getting commissioned to write uh, a dance track for a, a wedding. I don't know. It's sort of like... Um, but generally, it involves making music. Um so that's the role of the composer. But for video games, um, it also varies, um, but generally is to provide the soundtrack and the background music for the gameplay. Um, and for sound design, uh, sound design, I guess, is more literal in the sense that you're making sounds, literal sounds of things that happen in the game. For example, maybe footsteps or like a gunshot or something like that. But then you might have some more... Uh, out of these out, uh, like magical type sounds that are, are less specific and more out of this world, I suppose. But, yeah. Cool. And what is the creative process like for you when you start a new project? Um, different for every project. Uh, <laughs> but for, um, I suppose, the, the recent game, Hollow Knight, the, the creative process, uh, we essentially start looking at the game. I might play the game for a bit. Um, and uh, we talk about what, is needed, I suppose, in the game. Uh, what what the music? What I okay, come just coming back to the role again. What the role of the music is in the game, um, and uh, and in this case, it might be that the music has uh, to give a certain feeling for different areas, or a certain feeling for a character, or something like this. So, um, and then I take all that information away with me, and um, I'll go to my studio and start literally just jamming ideas on the piano and. I might come up with a th- melodic theme or something. I, I'm a very theme-based composer at the moment, so I'll try and find like a melody or a tune that I think evokes, tries to evoke that that mood, which comes back to the role of that particular place and um, and do a bit of variation on that. So, yeah. And speaking of Hollow Knight, now, Shell and I have been hyped for Hollow Knight for a very, very long time now. <laughs> it's been a fair while. It's been, it's been a while. We've been talking about ever since Pixels Rising got started, just just under a year ago, pretty much. And uh, we've, we're just really excited to play it in the weeks coming up as well. But when and how did you first get involved with the project? And what has it been like working with Team Cherry, the Adelaide based developer? It's been great. <laughs> um, so the way I got involved with Team Cherry early on... Um, there was quite a bit of interest from a few different composers when the Kickstarter went up and it was in the process of getting funded. Um, I was uh, lucky in the sense that I knew uh, Ari Gibson and his partner Makoto Koji, who I should, I'll just quickly digress and say she's got uh, a uh, company named or business name Paper Rabbits. Um, she makes a lot of interesting and really cool, cute animations you should all check out. Um, uh, but I, I recent before getting Hollow Knight, I did uh, music and sound for one of her films, um, and that was kind of, I guess, a way to show uh, her and also the team what I was capable of doing. And um, and I also wrote some sketches early on for Team Cherry before I had before the gig was confirmed, and that, that also helped me get get over the line. So, but with working with Team Cherry, they they're really great to work with. Um, and uh, like I mentioned before, we'll get together and we'll have a look at the game and discuss it. And they actually gave me this um, Word document early on, which was a treatment of the game, which sort of gave gave me an idea of what the world is like. And one thing that we kept coming back to was that the music should give a sense of uh, a kingdom that's fallen to ruin. 
the whole this whole underground world that Hollow Knight the game is taking place in is uh, called Hollow Nest, and it's like this underground bug world that's sort of fall into ruin as a result of some sort of plague or something you're not quite sure so you, you sort of explore through this world to try and find out what's what's happened so what the music is doing is it's uh it, i guess in a general sense it's giving hints on what the world used to be like but also uh the emotion of melancholy and loss of, of what it's now become i suppose so. So you've been working with them for the better part of just over two years because the Kickstarter was in late 2014 now. Yep. Yeah. And how regularly would you be meeting up with them and working with them? Because obviously that hasn't taken up your entire past two years. You've yep. probably been working on a few different projects. They'll like probably say not enough. <laughs> 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 there has been some other work in between that. So yeah, there's, it's a bit of jumping around. But um, I've tried to make myself as available as possible, especially in the last legs of this um of this production so um mm, hope that answers. well in balancing that were there any challenges you faced uh particularly with sound for hollow knight that you didn't face in other projects um uh that's a good question i haven't really <laughs> thought about that one. yeah there's also every uh, actually, i will say that every project has its own unique set of challenges and new problems always come up Especially problems that are very specific to that game, yeah, like you said, that you don't find in other other game projects and stuff. So um, I'm just trying to think of specific things, and nothing's coming to mind. <laughs> but I suppose the process for this one is a bit different from, say, Expand, where um, I was a bit more closely involved with the implementation of the music. I suppose it was only a music game, but with this, the tool set was completely different we were using this thing called unity which i hadn't really played around with much before and william uh i should give a big shout out to william from team cherry who is the basically the coder of the ai of all the enemies um does a lot of the design work um in terms of the uh, game design and um he's basically the implement implementer of the audio so this game would not have sounded as good at, as it is now if it weren't for William and and our ability to work together on on uh, how the mu so we discussed very early on how the music should be sometimes divided up into different layers so like you might have um, the main layer of the music which has a certain number of instruments that are playing at all times no matter where you are but then you might go off the beaten track into this sort of secluded um, mysterious room or something and then a whole bunch of instruments will come out so like that sort of thing wouldn't have happened if we weren't sort of really collaborating closely on that sort of stuff and if William hadn't been able to, you know, program that in. So, yeah, stuff like that. It's yeah, really cool. so working, also yeah, so working and living in LA with a, with a team in LA obviously helps a lot with collaboration. Yes, yeah, yeah. I would say so. <laughs> but it's getting much easier now. Like, despite the fact that we're living and working in Adelaide, a lot of the project was done remotely so i had a studio out at hendon and they were working in the city so we'd we'd basically call over the phone they'd chuck me on speaker and we'd talk that way we're using online chat rooms and stuff now to keep the communication going so it's all about communication mm. yeah so it sounds like it was quite a bit of back and forth in the whole process yeah, yeah sort of just feeding back on each other yeah that's yeah. it yeah like i guess like any creative team you kind of have to throw ideas around a lot and and uh see it see the project and the and the game evolve in a i guess some somewhat agile way i think they're sort of going for the agile business development app development kind of model i don't know if that's you know the specific term they would use for it but yeah it's it's very new to me but very exciting you've worked in various forms of media not just video games including film and tv um but how did you first get into video games did you play them a lot growing up or or there yes. was there any <laughs> any <laughs> yes and were there any in particular that stood out for you as well while growing up? Um, I, one I'll mention that I, I got a Nintendo sixty four. Um, I think when I was twelve or thirteen or something, and I played a lot of Banjo Kazooie, and uh, that's quite an influential game for me because, uh, especially with the music side of things, that did a lot of really interesting interactive music stuff where in one area you would have uh, certain instruments playing the theme and then you'd go underwater and then those instruments would be replaced by like marimba or underwater sounding harps or something like um so that's had a big influence on 
on myself as a composer. Um, another one is, I guess, uh, Legend of Zelda. Um, just the huge open world adventure side of it and uh, that each kind of town or place has a melodic theme to it. But what's really cool about that game is that you used a musical instrument in order to travel from one area to another. So you'd play the theme of that area on your ocarina in order to teleport there. And I thought that's a really cool mechanic. So, yeah. Is ocarina your favorite Zelda? Uh, I think so. <laughs> I want to... <laughs> Yes. I'll yeah. say yes. Yeah. <laughs> Excited for the Nintendo Switch and Breath of the Wild then? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Shell currently has a pre order. I don't myself. I'm still taking for some time. Yeah, yeah, I was so keen for it. I've heard so many, so many people are trying to beat me down, but you know what? I'm mm. excited. And Zelda is definitely the title I'm most excited for. So yeah. it's great to hear. It, yeah. it looks great. It looks yeah, really I'm, I'm slowly coming around. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting there. Mm. Um, and would you say video games were a big part of your development of becoming a composer and the sound, and the sound designer? Like, what was your path on, on those routes <laughs> to, those, to those jobs? And were, were video games a big part of that? Um, I would say, yeah, video games have been a big part of... I guess becoming a composer because they, from the very early stages, they were a big inspiration for me as a, um, uh, as I started playing the piano and started writing music. I would draw a lot from hearing video game soundtracks. So, um, but I actually, uh, in terms of becoming a career, I think I got a lot more uh, experience and work from doing short corporate videos and animations with a bunch of different directors in Adelaide and, and short films. So I didn't really get into getting paid work for games until a bit later. Um, so, I, yeah, it, it, I guess as a composer, you can't, or in my opinion, from my, own, from my own experience, you can't just sort of, I guess, only do one very specific thing unless you know, I guess, a lot of contacts who can pay you to do that yeah. for a living. Um, so I also do sound design um and i also do a bunch of work for uh kids tv at the moment um and have done tv advertisements and all that sort of stuff as well so mm. yeah are there any soundtracks from any current games that you particularly like um uh, i would say the last guardian oh and i don't know if this is pronounced well but um abzu by abzu. austin Wintry. Abzu, abzu, abzu yeah i love oh. abzu I, it must be like one of the shortest games ever made, but I'm <laughs> glad that it doesn't go longer because they've sort of found the right ebb and flow within that kind of three or four hour game time. Uh, but it, um, I played it in two sittings, but that second half of the game was like, like oh, blown away. It's, it's brilliant. So yeah. The reason, it, I w maybe we should talk about why <laughs> <laughs> for those who haven't played it. Um, it's uh, underwater uh uh, I guess adventure game or yeah. something. If you and play Journey, it's pretty much a spiritual successor to Journey. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, definitely. And um, just the way the music swells as your kind of um, uh, reaching the afterlife or something of of this weird underground world, and it's sort of like this that evokes this feeling of joy that I haven't experienced in a game probably ever. <laughs> You are listening to Pixels Rising on Radio Adelaide, and we are talking to Christopher Larkin, a video game composer and sound designer. Now, you've worked on uh, a few other Australian projects, including with Chris Johnson on Expand, and and that was actually my first time I saw any of your work. It was a couple of years ago mm -hmm. at a game dev test, and that was the first time I met Chris and just playing Expand, and I was I was really intrigued by the game, but the music as well really drew me in how did you first get involved with expand did you know chris johnson beforehand yeah so with expand i met chris at a uh, avcon um at the indie dev room and uh i actually just sat down and played the game and he had some existing temp uh piano tracks in there already that were okay um and they, i could sort of see a lot of potential for the game and being my natural kind of um uh wanting to sort of help it. I kind of got in touch with Chris and said, like, let's... And he got back in touch with me and said, and we um, went we went from there. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so we kept catching up for coffee and just discussing what this game is all about and all that sort of stuff. And I, ascended it, I kept sending him different sketches with um, different piano themes and mel melodic motives. And 
Um, and this was while he was designing the world of the game as well. So I guess while I was writing the music and he was designing the levels, we were able to bring these two different things together in a really unified way. Um, and yeah, I, often people ask what what is the game about? And we always struggle to <laughs> answer that because it's quite an existential sort of thing where uh, it's really up to the, the listener what, what, what the game is about and um, people were drawing all, all sorts of their own unique experiences from it um, so yeah it's a, it's a game we're both really proud of so to you um, what is the game about at one point I would have said it's about relationships um, but I'm not sure I, I, I've actually taken a bit of a break for the game so I have to go back and play it um, but for those who don't know it's um, from a distance from from the the uh, visual side of it it's a this black and white um labyrinth sort of adventure game where you control a pink square through an ever changing and evolving maze um but the way that the world unravels in front of you and closes up behind you is done in a kind of i guess uh ebb and flow sort of way akin to kind of like a dance or something um, and that's where the music comes in and, and evokes certain emotions. And it's the weird combination of this very simple black and white art style with the simple piano tones that I think we touched on something that kind of moves people, I suppose. So, um, But for me personally, yeah, like I said, it was about relationships and now I don't know. I'll have to go back and play it <laughs> in maybe a year or something. I think that's when you see the most strength is in art when you can come back to it and you s have different perspectives on it and you get different feelings from it. Mm. And it's not just one straight thing that you can read straight away that you understand that you have to interpret. And when someone, in when lots of different people interpret it differently, I think that shows when the art is at its best, really. Yeah, so a lot of art needs to be thought-provoking and, and everyone has a lot of their own experiences from it. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I like about Expand. It's very much an experience. You know, as opposed to a conventional game, it's very much an art game. And Molly and I both uh, played it early. How how long ago? Probably like midway through last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably August, September. Was it that late? I think it was. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, one of the things I really liked was that uh, there were a few different components that worked together. Like it would have been a very different game if it had, if it had different music. Mm, mm. You know, so that was something I really enjoyed. And was it one of your first big view game projects or had you been working on other games before Expand? Um, so directly before Expand, I worked with Matt Trobiani, who's just recently released Hacknet. Um, but he made a game called Hatland Adventures, which was a sort of like an endless runner platformer. I think that's the right terminology. But you uh, you have to avoid getting uh, eaten by this sort of wall of fire. Eaten? Burnt by this wall of fire. <laughs> And jump all the platforms and collect hats until you have this endless sort of pile of hats on <laughs> on your head as a platformer um, character. Um, so I did some drum and bass music for that, which is completely different from the work I did on Expand, but that was kind of fun. Um, and that's sort of how I met Chris, because we were showing Hatland Adventures at Avcon, and um, I was invited to come and help show the game, and that's where I met Chris, so yeah. Just a community uh, coming together, yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so would you say Expand was your first big project then? or um, In terms of games with other people, yes. But before that, in my teens, I made a bunch of little games on Game Maker. Um, one of them was called, this one called Little Blue Goopy, which I need to find the Game Maker file for because it'd be really amusing to sort of bring it up. But it's basically Mario, but different art. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. <laughs> uh, so for Expand and now Hollow Knight, you composed the soundtracks, but for Pac-Man 256, you did the sound design. Yes, yeah? that's correct. So what was that like, focusing on that sound design rather than the soundtrack? It was nerve-wracking <laughs> <laughs> because um, it was through Hipster Whale, but it was also for Namco, and they basically gave us the a lot of the original sound effects, um, and we had this sort of pressure to tick a whole bunch of boxes and, and one of them was to cr create and to provide something new but one of the other extremes was to stick true to the traditional pac-man universe and don't go too far off doing your own thing so i defined this kind of neat balance between um those two extremes so 
what I ended up doing was I included a lot of the original sound effects into the new sound design and basically kind of remixed the old sound effects um, and additionally worked with Tim Witt, who's a, a local DJ, but also sound designer. And together we designed a whole bunch of unique synth sounds, which we used in conjunction with the original sounds and made the sound effects for that. So, so obviously yeah. a lot of different challenges compared to working on Expand or Hollow Knight. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Diff- different hats to wear. Yeah, and, <laughs> and how did you become involved in that project? So that project was uh, through the Other World Agency, who uh, is headed by Fabian. Fabian, Marbello. yeah, yeah. Fabian's a great guy, yeah. Yeah, he's very <laughs> nice. Um, so I met Fabian at uh, GCAP, I think it was, in 2014, which is when we went over there with Expand. And um, yeah, Fabian was was really great. I, I offered my services to him as, a, as an agent and um, he got me the gig. Um, then we went from there. So that's it. I, I talked through Andy Sum through um, Skype in collaboration with him. Um, and uh, since then, I've done some more work with Three Sprockets, which um, also helped out on Pac-Man. Um, and that work has included uh, a recent project called Outfolded, which is this, it's another kind of, very different from Expand, but it's similar in the sense that it's a puzzle game and it's quite meditative in nature and involves lots of shapes. So get, get, you can get that on on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so already, phone Android. So Sorry. already you've mentioned a fair amount of Australian uh, devs and this network and this community hmm. um, of composers and programmers and the like. And you've worked with quite a number of them in recent years on sound design and composing soundtracks. So what's your thoughts on the Australian industry of games as a whole? Do you see uh, it with a bright future? So just Australian or South Australian? or I guess Australian I guess as a whole, yeah. As a whole. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's great. And I think there's a really big surgence of um, the indie industry growing and getting larger. And as the tools become more easily available and, and uh, it, much easier for everyone to make their own game, um, I think there are a lot more opportunities for people who are looking to get into the industry um, and who are able to make content for the for games much easier. So, yeah. And South Australia as well. Like, we've got a number of games coming out this year, uh, including Hollow Knight, but also uh, Need to Know mm. from Monomyth Games and Icebox as well mm. from Eden Games. Yeah, like, there's, there's a lot more games coming out of Adelaide in general. Like, do you see the... What do you think of the development scene here? Like, it, it seems like it's growing rapidly. I think it's growing really rapidly, and I think it's really good to see um, community events like ARG and the game testing sessions that are happening that are allowing us all to come together and work together on these sort of things. And... Um, I think it's really good. Yeah. Do you have any other big projects coming up now that Hollow Knight's pretty much finished? Um, I will be uh, not so much in the game world, but I'll be working on uh, a kid's show called uh, Reggie, which is um, a show by Luke Juravicious. I've done some work with him before um, on this program called um, Figaro Foe. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be do- working on that. Um but as for games, not so much. I've got some ideas for my own projects, but uh, they're all a bit too scattered, so I'll have to narrow narrow them down. So. Is there any games in the industry that you're looking forward to at the moment or you'd like to see yourself composing for? Um, I, as I've been working pretty hard on Hollow Knight, I, I haven't been coming up for air very much, <laughs> so I'll need to do a bit of research and, and have a look at what's, what's happening. But uh, very exciting for very excited for the new switch that's coming out and the consequently the new zelda so yeah. definitely are there any particular goals you're setting yourself for the future to work on more gigs like this uh for with bigger budgets an opportunity to work with more live musicians i've been working a lot on uh my computer and sample libraries and, and all that sort of stuff but to have a, a budget set aside where i can pay a string quartet to do like the whole score be really great so um yeah just to keep going basically and keep doing this sort of stuff and finally what advice would you give to aspiring sound designers and composers who are looking to get into the view game industry doing exactly what you've been doing um i think there's a couple things one is like if you're wanting to improve <coughs> your craft as a composer uh learning an instrument such as the keyboard uh, enables you to really understand how music works in terms of harmony and melody. Obviously, you can do that on guitar as well, but from my own experience, I'd highly recommend a keyboard instrument. Um, and having that 
on one side while learning the technology. Um, so having those skills are really important. But once you do have those sort of skills, um, I highly recommend going to game jams, um, uh, going to shows like Avcon and meeting up with a lot of developers there, uh, getting to community events like ARG, uh, which happen in, in Adelaide, but I'm sure there's plenty of other uh, game networking events interstate or overseas, all that sort of thing. So um, I think there's a lot of ways you can get connected with the game industry and, and start making stuff. Well, if you enjoy beautiful, classically inspired video game soundtracks, be sure to check out Chris's work on Expand and Hollow Light online on your Bandcamp page at christopherlarkin.bandcamp.com. And you can also follow Chris on Twitter at Composer Larkin as well. You've been posting um, up until the lead up mm-hmm. of Hollow Night, you've been posting little bits of the tracks each week. Yes, and I post, I'll keep it going for as long as I can. <laughs> so I did another one today. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, this has been Molly and Shell from Pixels Rising. You can listen in to the show every Wednesday night from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. online, digitally and at, locally at 101.5 FM Radio Alley's on-air video game program. <laughs>